for allowing us to do that. So we want to welcome you to the program of the University of Arkansas Small Business Technology and Development Center. We're pleased to be able to bring you these educational programs to help support small businesses in the region and the state. I'll introduce Nikki momentarily, um, but I'm Amy Robinson, and I'd also like to introduce um, some of my colleagues. We have Chris Kays. Chris, if you want to wave. Um, I believe Lindsay Ramsey is um, joining via phone. She is one of our colleagues that coordinated getting Nikki here. So I want to do a thank you for her. We also have some of our ASB TDC consultants um, so here. And so if you all um, are looking at your um, video, if you wave and if, as an ASB TDC consultant, just say hi. Um, Good morning. Good morning. We joined the ASB TDC as consultants to help businesses through COVID and have become an extended team helping support through educational programs like this and more. The ASB TDC is a one stop shop for startups and existing small businesses. We are affiliated with a statewide ASB TDC as well as national network of more than a thousand small business centers. Locally, we offer free one on one consulting and workshops like this one covering relevant topics for business owners. And if you're not already a client, we encourage you to visit us at sbtdc.uark.edu. So today we are bringing you marketing photos from your iPhone with Nikki Toth. This is a workshop format and we are working to keep it as close to our in-person workshops as possible. We welcome you to keep your video on, interact and ask questions if we are just as if we were with you in person. I will advise you that as a free service, we all will be recording our workshops for ASB TDC education purposes, which I already mentioned. And we know that many will benefit from what Nikki has to share with us today. The thing that will be slightly different is navigating technology. You will notice that you are on mute when you arrived. As a workshop, we encourage questions as we go along and you have a few options to do that. If you um, unmute, we will see your video square will light up um, even if your video is off. And so you can give a good old fashioned ahem. Um, if you have something that you want to attribute, um, you can also use the raise hand feature if you click in the, um, the bar down below where it says participants. We heavily encourage the use of the chat feature. This has been one of the best things about facilitating online workshops and webinars um, is the chat feature. We will be monitoring and we will answer those questions in the flow of conversation. You're also welcome to answer and message one another. So at all other times, just keep your volume on mute. So now we are happy to introduce our workshop presenter, Nikki Toth. Hi, Nikki. Nikki is a professional photographer for small business, nonprofit organization, and families for the past six years. Her professional style is to capture the true essence of her subjects, and she wants to help you capture the essence of your business and do it on an everyday basis with base technology, your phone. So this workshop um, is to learn the basics of photography techniques and skills using your smartphone. So she will discuss the tips and tricks of how to do that. Um, we also want to let you know that there will be a second workshop that will also be an interactive um, part of what we're doing. So we're kind of setting you up for that next workshop. So Nikki, it's all yours. Take it away. We're excited. Great. Thank you so much, Amy, and, and to the team for having me today. I'm so excited to talk about this. This is um, one of my favorite things about being a photographer is being able to share this information with um, my clients and people who are just interested in improving their photography skills. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you as your business owner or an employee at your company are the best storyteller that you have. I can come in and I do very often come into families or into businesses and I try to get to know you um, a little bit and get to know the culture of your organization or the personality of your family and I try to capture that in images and that is what I love to do. Um, but as somebody who is there and passionate about it and, and in that business every day, you have a, a very special perspective and a very special strength that I don't have um, to be able to really capture your vision and your mission and what the values are of your organization to be able to present, present that in um, photographs. So my job here today and in the next session are to just equip you with some skills to be able to create um, more beautiful photos that capture that, that communication that you want to get out there. So um, 
I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And I apologize in advance because I'm a little bit uh, clumsy at doing this, but we're gonna do our best. So here we go. All right. So we're gonna, so this is a, um, a quote from Ansel Adams, um, the single most important component of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. And that's sort of foundational to what we're talking about today. It doesn't matter if you are using um, a big fancy DSLR that has a million settings and a, a million different buttons, um, whether you know how to use them or not, <laughs> or if you're using a point and shoot or even a disposable camera um, or your phone, which is what we're gonna focus on this weekend next time. Um, truly the most important part of that camera is the user of the camera. Um, and so this week we're going to focus on um, three things that I feel like are foundational to any sort of um, photography education. First, we're going to talk about light, which um, no matter what you're shooting with, you need to be able to understand light and be able to find um, flattering light in your um, in your business, in your situation, and learn how to deal with light that's a little bit more challenging or not quite as naturally flattering. Um, and then we're going to talk about elements of composition. And these are tools that help you to guide your viewer's eyes through your photograph and help communicate the feeling that you're looking to, to communicate. Elements of composition are not um, specific to photography. They're something that are used in any art form. So, um, but they're really helpful and fun to play with and um, just to try different things with. So we'll talk about a lot of elements of composition that you can use as tools to help communicate your message. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about storytelling in your photography. And so we'll talk at the end, we'll talk about some steps towards um, um, effectively and beautifully telling the story of your organization through your photography. I think that um, probably most of us here today are um, here to learn photography for social media or marketing or maybe your website, that sort of thing, something that you want to be able to communicate, particularly with social, social media, communicate um, often and consistently with your audience. And so being able to use these tools in a consistent manner and use the storytelling techniques that we'll talk about will help to um, begin to really tell your story through your social media and, and marketing platforms. So, um, so I would love it if um, you would maybe put down in the chat what type of businesses are being represented today. Um, I had a little bit of an idea prior to, but I would love to know who's here today so that we can um, kind of maybe tailor the conversation a little bit um, more specifically to the types of businesses. If we have restaurants represented, it would I would love to be able to know that so that I can talk a little bit more about low light or if we have businesses where we have lots of action, then we can talk about trying to capture um, uh, action without motion blur, things like that. So. Um, some things that we won't be covering in this series are that we, we won't have time this time or next time to talk about learning how to shoot in manual mode. So if you do have a DSLR and you want to learn how to use all of those settings and buttons, that's not something we're going to have time to do. But there are a million online options um, to learn how to use all those settings. So, uh, And then we're also not going to be able to have time to talk about specifics of um, social media strategies. but. I know that there's lots of resources out there um, on that also. So we're just not going to be able to have time for that in this series. So like I mentioned before, I strongly believe that you are your company's best storyteller and photographer, if only because you are there every day and you have the passion that I, as an outsider, could, could never have. So you're able to, you have the time to capture um, you may not have a lot of time, but you, you are there with your, your people and your clients and your team um, all the time where I may just come in for an hour or two to shoot. So you're going to be able to capture those moments that really help to communicate your, your company's message to your audience. So, so we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about light first because light, I feel like, is absolutely the most important element of photography. So if we had to break it down into two um, components, then we would look at natural light versus artificial light. 
And with light, there's really no guesswork. You don't have to wonder what it's going to look like. You know it is what you see. I mean, you get what you get with light. Um, typically speaking, natural light is going to be the most flattering to skin tones, to, um, to uh, portraiture, anything like that. It's always, natural light's always going to be a lot more um, uh, flattering. So if you, um, I just wanted to share some examples. So of course, we have some natural light here in this graduation photo. Um, and then some other examples, we have, of course, some a more beautiful natural light on the left um, with a girl hanging from the tree. Uh, and then we have some indoor light that is probably fluorescent. Um, you can tell on the bottom, the boys who are working in the science lab, they have a little bit of a greenish tinge to them. And then the, the boys on the top at the, at the Cub Scout um, Pinewood Derby have a little bit of an orange kind of yellowish tinge to them. So that's part of the challenge with artificial light is that there's often a color cast that's not natural. So um, if you're dealing with like an incandescent light bulb, it typically looks pretty orange. If you're look, dealing with fluorescent lighting, it can look really green. Um, and typically artificial lighting for the most part is straight overhead. So it's coming from the top down. So you'll see, of course, the boy in the middle, who's my son, um, he has his hat on. So that's adding to the, to the shadowing on his face, but the little boy next to him, you can see the shadows are because the light's coming directly from the top down. And then it has that sort of orangey glow to it. So um, indoor light can be pretty challenging. Now, of course, there's no way to completely avoid indoor light particularly for certain businesses who may not have a lot of windows or where the, um, the action or the, uh, the subject matter that you're wanting to capture is not something that you can move near to a window. So, um, so we'll talk about some ways to, to work with that more challenging artificial light. Nikki, I just wanna um, mm -hmm. just let you know that we have a great set of um, businesses here. Everything oh, from a yoga, stu yoga studio, um, a food truck, um, and um, Sharon, thank you for um, sharing that um, you are with a bank. And so um, merchandise and some other things um, are, are what's going on for you. Um, and thank you also, Candace, um, re uh, property rental, an Airbnb business. So that is um, fantastic. And then also professional service and a toy store. So we've got everything from products to people to, <laughs> to properties. That's wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing that. Great, thanks so much, Amy. That's good to know. I love to know um, specifics as much as I can so that we can talk about um, things like action or window light, things like that, that'll be more relevant to your situation. So, um, so after we break down uh, natural light versus artificial light, we can look at directions of light. Um, we, there's four main directions of light. We can look at side light, which is an example here in this photo. Um, I took her portrait so that she was facing about um, 90 degrees more or less from the window that's on her right side. So you can see the light coming in. Um, side light is a beautiful light to use. You can find side light in your facility um, near a window or an open door. Um, if you have garage doors, you can use, open those up and grab that natural light as side light. Um, side light's really beautiful and flattering. It can be a little bit more challenging if the inside, if the opposite of the light is particularly dark, because you can have some really harsh shadows on that side of the face. But in her situation, um, on, on her right, so on the left side of the photo, there was a white wall, so it provided a little bit of, um, of some bouncing light back, so it made the, the shadowing pretty um, flattering for her. And then we have some more examples of different types of light. The little girl, the portrait in the top corner, hers is flat light. So I take, a, I take these types of portraits for children um, twice a year and they've become super popular and they're so much fun to take because we use them as sort of an alternative to traditional school pictures because I love to capture kids expressions and just sort of try to get their personality in photos. And so, but my setup for these photos literally could not be more simple. I sit her in front of a window. So she is facing the window 
and I'm between her and the window and I take my picture. <laughs> so there's literally no magic involved and she, and they're fantastic. And so that, that, that's called flat light where that light is facing the subject um, uh, directly parallel to their face. Um, and that is something that phone cameras handle terrifically. Um, it is the easiest light to shoot in and your phone camera will be able to do it really well. So um, again, you'll find this type of light in the same places where you will the side light. So if you have windows in your facility or um, if you have doors that you can open, or again, those garage doors, which are, I'm just in love with garage door light because it's so beautiful. You can open up those garage doors and just flood your space with light, set your, um, your subject right there at the edge of the light at the door, and what will happen is that your camera will expose properly for your subject's face and the background will naturally darken. Now in this photograph, I do have a backdrop, so it's black behind her. So it's pretty, um, it's more exaggerated there. But um, you'll see a, a picture in a little while of um, in my literal garage with my daughter and you'll see how just naturally the background darkens up. So it can be a way of really, um, of highlighting your subject and separating them from the background. So we'll talk about that again and when we talk about elements of composition. Um, and then if we go there on the left, the family picture, um, that's backlight. So if you can see through the trees, the sun is directly behind them. So backlight would mean that the subject, the light is behind your subject and you're shooting towards the light rather than having it behind you. Um, Backlight can be really challenging for phone cameras. We will talk a lot more about um, exposure and phone cameras and their challenges next time. Um, but so we'll talk about how phone camera sensors work next time. But just suffice it to say, like in this type of situation, it probably would be okay. This is actually taken with my regular camera, not my phone. But um, if there's an, a little bit of an overcast day, or if you can diffuse that backlight by something, like in this case, there's, I, I keep pointing at the screen as though you can see where I'm pointing, but um, the branches of the tree um, act as a diffuser for that sunlight coming through. So that helps your phone camera to be able to expose your subjects properly. Um, and again, we'll talk about words like exposure and, and sensors and things like that next time, but. Um, I just wanted to show an example of backlight and say that um, it's beautiful and it's fun to work with, but it can be a little bit of a challenge. So it just takes more practice um, to figure out what um, locations work well for you. So, and then in the bottom right hand corner, um, we have an example of top down light. So this would be like midday outside light. Um, it is not usually very flattering for portraits because you have a lot of shadowing from their eyebrows and glasses and things like that. However, that brightness is fantastic for capturing action, especially on your phone, because we don't have the type of settings on our phones that we have on a DSLR, we have to kind of help it along. So um, that bright midday sunshine is fantastic for capturing really quick action because you have lots of light to work with and you're less likely to have that motion blur that you can have when it's a little bit darker. So um, so that's an example of, of the top down bright light. Excellent. Nikki, do you want to pause for any questions? I know yes. that um, you know punching buttons and raising hands and doing some of that is um, sometimes uh, a little uh, difficult. So again, feel free to hem or kind of interject or say, "Hey, Nikki, I have a quick question." Um, so feel free to do that at any point in time. Yes, please. I actually I can't seem to find. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I'm trying to figure all this out. Oh, that's all right. We got gotcha. you. Okay, yeah, if you see any questions, because I can't see the chat, if you see any questions pop up, just let me know and I'll definitely, I would love any questions. It's, it's a little bit um, different for me to be doing this via Zoom because I'm used to lots of interaction and conversation. So um, hearing myself talk <laughs> without any pausing <laughs> is, is different for me. So please ask any questions. I know it can feel a little bit more intimidating asking questions when you have to type them in or or do something like that as opposed to just, you know, yell them out in class, but please do um, ask questions. 
Okay, so we've talked about um, the different types of light, natural light and artificial light, and we've talked about directions of light. So now let's talk about some practical things like where to find the best light. Um, areas of open shade are fantastically easy for your phone to capture um, flattering port pictures. So what you want to be careful of is that there isn't bright light behind your subject. So an example of this would be if you found a big tree that cast a nice shadow on the ground and you placed your subject, whatever it's doing underneath that tree, you run the risk of seeing through the tree and seeing that bright fluorescent green grass behind you. So that, that type of thing can be really challenging for your phone camera to capture. So what you wanna look for is open shade, perhaps like an awning with a building behind it, um, or the side of a building where the sun is on the other side, so the building is casting the shade, um, where you have consistent shade and you don't have bright sunlight through the shade. Um, so any time of day that's not, you know, noon or one o'clock or whenever the sun would be the most straight overhead, you're going to be able to find um, shade cast from buildings or awnings or porches or things like that um, outdoors. And I mentioned the porches and so then doors, garage doors. And um, this picture here is in my garage and it was taken with my phone um, of my daughter a few years ago. And so that light is just completely natural light on her face. I open up the garage door and now you can see a little bit of, it's really my husband's shop, it's not our garage. <laughs> he's, he's corrected me about that. So you see lots of his tools and things back there. Um, and if I had taken a second, I could have cleared that space a little bit. However, naturally, my phone sensor exposed properly for her face and the back of the background naturally darkened. So that can help to create that um, separation between your subject and your background so that it, um, you're not too distracted by what's in the background, all the tools and mess that are back there. Um, so you can prop open doors, garage doors, windows are fantastic. Window light is lovely and it's generally very diffused. So what that word means is that the sun is not streaming in and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the easier light to shoot in is that diffused light where the sun, um, like right now I'm sitting in front of a window and the wind, the sun is not streaming in on my face, but I'm getting this nice soft diffused light on my face. Um, and then cloudy and overcast days are also fantastic. So they give you a lot more flexibility than sunny days. In fact, I often have clients who are, who are sad that it's, it's sun or it's cloudy on the day of their shoot. And I just remind them that that actually gives us a lot more flexibility, particularly if we're trying to shoot towards the middle part of the day outside, which can be much more challenging if it's sunny because you have those really bright highlights on their forehead. And then you get those dark shadows underneath their eyebrows and their glasses and underneath their chin. Um, whereas a, a cloudy overcast day sort of creates like a soft diffusion of the light in the sky and it can make it a lot easier to capture those outdoor photos. So um, so this is just five examples of places where you're going to typically be able to find light that is very easy for your phone to handle. So more difficult light, um, mixed lighting. So we talked about the natural and the artificial light. Mixed lighting is both of them together in the same place. So in this, in this photograph here, you see these students um, and the light coming through the window, of course, is natural sunlight. And then the light in the classroom um, is some kind of light bulb that I don't know the name of. <laughs> so it's, but you can see the difference in the temperature. So the temperature of light, we basically talk about like warmer light or cooler light. Um, there's you know, different ways of categorizing the temperature of the light that is not important. But, um, but what is important is that the mixed light can create problems in your photographs in that you see like around the children's desks and sort of um, like the little boy with the curly hair, his hair looks really yellowy orange, but then you see that light coming through the window that looks really cool and almost kind of bluish. So mixed light can be really challenging to deal with. Um, if you have a lamp on next to a window, you're going to have that competing colors of light that can look really weird in a photograph. So my suggestion 
all the time, no matter what, is if you have enough light with your indoor light turned off. So if you're in a situation where you can open a door or you can open curtains, um, turn your lights off. Um, in fact, I have this overhead light on right now that's kind of driving me crazy because I can see, I can see that it's like orange on my shoulder and I almost turned it off, but I left it on. But, um, so that makes, Nikki, how relevant this is to zoom as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so the mixed light, if you, if you have enough light with your artificial light turned off, turn it off and just try it. You know I mean? That's the thing. Like with these phones, we can shoot hundreds and hundreds of pictures and see what works best for our taste. And so um, my preference is always, I would even prefer a, a lower light, more dramatic photo with the indoor light turned off than I would having the mixed light. And that's just my preference. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, now dappled light, that would be an example of that would be um, the middle of the day, you're outside, it's sunny and you're underneath a tree. So you have like the dappley sort of shade and bright light. Um, I just kind of recommend avoiding that whenever you can. If you do decide that that's exactly where you want to take your picture, or if there's something naturally happening there that you just want to capture, my recommendation is to not have your subject looking at you because then you're going to see all that dappled light on their face. If they're looking down at what they're doing, um, that tends to be a much more forgiving type of photograph than one where they're looking straight at the camera if they have that dappley light on their face. Um, and then we talked about that hard streaming light. Um, this is gonna be a, a matter of you just becoming a subject or a student of the light in your space. So you, what, you, what you'll do is if you start paying attention to the light in your space, you'll notice that you know in the mornings at 11 o'clock, the light streams in this one particular window. And so I wanna avoid that if I'm looking for a more diffused light. Um, what, what the problem with a hard streaming light is that it confuses your phone's sensor. So um, your phone, we'll talk a bunch more about this next time, but your phone's sensor only has a certain um, range in which it can handle really bright light and really dark shadows. So what it ends up doing is it ends up making that really bright light explode and sort of, um, it's called being blown out. And it means that it becomes like white and there's no, um, there's no, there's no um, information there anymore. So, and then the same can happen with dark shadows. So if you give your phone a situation to shoot where you're giving it super bright light and dark shadows, it's not really gonna know how to handle it. So. Uh, we'll talk about some modes that can help with that next time. Um, but I just want to, that hard streaming light can be difficult to work with. And then we talked a little bit about the overhead light and the midday sun. Um, my suggestions for those types of situations are similar to the dappled light. If you're inside and you have that overhead light, have your subjects engaged in something. So they're not looking at you with all those shadows on their face. Like in this situation, the boys and the girl are, are doing their schoolwork together. So the overhead light isn't quite as much of an issue. And then that midday sun, like I mentioned before, is a perfect time to capture quick action because your phone is gonna be able to use all that light to um, capture that action without blur. Um, and then we talked a little bit about uh, that hard streaming light. And in these photographs, these are some examples of, um, of using hard streaming light and little pockets of light to your advantage. And we'll talk about this next time, but your phone, there are modes that you can use to tell your phone sensor to expose in one certain spot. Now it doesn't, it's not foolproof and it doesn't work as well as a DSLR would work, but sometimes you can trick it into exposing properly. So like the boy, that's my son, in the bottom corner, um, leaning against the bed, that is a super bright, um, streaming sun that's coming in from, from the, th the French doors. And so I told my camera sensor, I, I want you to expose properly for his face. And so it, it made it so that his face wasn't blown out and then the rest of the room naturally dropped into shadow. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, like I said, we'll talk about that next time as far as telling your, your phone's camera sensor where to expose. Um, and then the other examples, well, we have another streaming light example in the upper left-hand corner, 
But then the other two um, examples are more of just sort of finding those pockets of light to make a more dramatic photograph. So that's a fun way to just kind of play around. One of them, of course, is um, artificial light from the iPad or whatever it is that she's playing with. And then the bottom right hand corner um, is just a bounced light, a reflection from um, the paperwork that she's working with on the table. So those little pockets of light can be fun to play with also. So that's, that's our conversation about light. If we want to see if anybody has any questions about that, then we can move on to composition. Nikki, I just have a quick question, um, and maybe some other people do too, just thinking about the um, who we have um, in the workshop today. Um, when it comes to objects, um, and you're probably going to come across this in just a minute, but since we're talking about everything from property to items, we do have some people photographing people. Um, when it comes to light, what does that, how does that, are we really, the subject is the subject, whether it's a person or if it's a, or if it's a, a thing, is that, <laughs> is that kind of what we're, we're deducing from that? Absolutely. Um, I think that we can treat our subjects the same, no matter what it is that we're shooting. If you are wanting to shoot product photography, um, then you have even more flexibility because you can put it exactly where you want it to be. Whereas sometimes I think we feel pressured to capture human or animal subjects um, in the moment that it's happening and it can be a little bit more um, difficult. But um, which, by the way, I don't think you should feel that pressure. I think it's completely okay to set up photographs to say what you did was really cool. Do it again over here by the window. <laughs> so um, I used to be hardcore when it came to that and I would only capture things as they naturally happened. But then I realized that I'm really only in spaces for a couple of hours at a time. And um, there's just not that much time to, to, to wait for something to happen. Sometimes I think that we have to just kind of naturally coax it to happen. So, um, but when it comes to, to photographing objects, yes, absolutely use that same natural light, turn those inside lights off, move it close to the window. Um, you can use the, the flat light or the side light, whichever one is the most flattering for the object that you're shooting. Um, and then you can also look at things like creating a soft box, which is, um, now that's a little bit really something that we have the time to talk about today, but there's tons of videos online. If you just search, um, you know, like product photography or softbox, you can make those yourselves really easily um, by using um, white, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of, like the, the things that kids use to make uh, like a stand up science fair project, you know what I mean? Like the little trifold. It's like a hard white board that's trifold and kids use them for science fairs. You can create, you can buy one of those already made and set it in your space that's next to the window and place your object in the middle of it. And then you have really nice light all the way around. So um, it can soften those shadows if you're going for the side light. Um, and it just really creates nice diffused white um, neutral light for your for your objects that you're shooting because typically you want whatever the photo whatever the color is of your object to be true so you want to try to avoid those those artificial lights as much as you can so i think there's really simple ways of doing that without having to have um you know professional lighting or anything like that i think that with a little bit of creativity you can diy a space that works really well so and that and that so that would also work for food it sounds like absolutely yeah and then do you, have any, do you have any recommendations about um, property? So if somebody is, is taking pictures of rooms, kind of mm -hmm. best times of day, or I know yeah. that you talked about the streaming filter or any of those things, because yeah. um, sometimes people are doing property um, Absolutely. photos. I think that for property photos, whenever I'm shooting inside, I always try to do that in the middle of the day because you're going to have the least amount of that streaming light coming in. When the sun is as high overhead as it can be, that is when the light's going to be the most consistent throughout the house or the property. So um, the middle of the day, I highly recommend. And of course, that middle of the day is varies depending on the time of year. So, um, so you just kind of have to become a student of, of light and just sort of watch your space, you know, go um, a couple times over the course of the day and see when the light is the most consistent in the space. Of course, open all the windows, all the blinds, turn off all the inside light whenever possible. Um, yeah, so I think that, and I think that the, 
the um, cameras these days have the ability to have a really wide angle, which typically is used for um, resident, you know, uh, property photography. I don't actually do property photography, but what I've what I've noticed just watching it is that they tend to use a really wide angle, and I think it. Um, I know I have an iPhone 11. Um, and I have an option of having a wide view, a wide angle. And I think that you can, um, if your phone does not have that setting uh, native to the phone, you can get um, lenses that connect to your phone that create a wide angle. And so that typically will make a room look bigger um, than it is, <laughs> whether that's okay or not. <laughs> but that's what they do. So. <laughs> Um, is they use a really wide angle um, for their photography and it makes the room look really huge. So, um, but if your phone doesn't have that as a native setting, I know that there are lenses that you can buy to, to do that same thing. And phones these days, I think unless you are going to be printing the photographs, um, I think a, a phone, a newer phone, not even the newest, but just a newer phone can take photographs that look fantastic and could be used online completely so awesome we like to hear that <laughs> <laughs> it's really amazing I feel like um, a grandma when I talk about like how impressed I am with phones <laughs> but it's true they really <laughs> they've really come a long way so <laughs> so let's move on a little bit so we talked about light and now we're going to talk about elements of composition um, and I'm just checking my time. So we're going to move through these just a tiny bit faster. There's quite a few, um, so don't feel overwhelmed. Well, I'm going to give you some tips at the end um, or probably throughout now that it's at the top of my head um, to how to handle all of them because it's a lot of, it's a lot of information to take in, but um, know that you don't need to do all of it at once or and it's really impossible to do all of it in one photograph. So all of these two elements of composition are just tools. They're just ways to make your photograph um, more eye-catching, to help um, communicate the story that you're trying to tell, and to help move your viewer's eyes through your photograph. So I know we've all looked at photographs that are just a snapshot and they can be, you can look at them and think to yourself, what am I supposed to be looking at? There's so much to see. Nothing is obvious as the main subject. Um, Whereas if you are um, intentional in your shooting and your setting up of your, of your picture, you can make it very obvious what the main subject is. You can elicit a feeling or an emotion from your viewer or um, uh, just to help communicate the mission of your story. So, so we'll move on from there. And here's our list. And like I said, don't feel overwhelmed. <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> So the first element of composition is the rule of thirds. And so what that means is that if you were to take a tic-tac-toe board and put it over the top of your, um, of your photograph or your art piece or anything else creative, um, naturally our eyes are going to go to where those four corners meet in the center of a tic-tac-toe board. Um, and then secondarily, they're gonna look along the lines. So if you look in your phone under your camera settings, there is an option to turn on your grid. And the grid is the tic-tac-toe rule of thirds board. So I have mine on. I recommend turning it on. We'll talk more about it next time. Um, but if you look at these two photographs I have here, we have um, Mayor Jordan in the bottom left-hand corner and his face is exactly on the upper left-hand corner of that inside tic-tac-toe square. And then the little boy on the upper right hand corner who's seeing his dad home from deployment, he is on the bottom right hand corner of that of that square. So um, the other thing that I want to mention about all of these elements of composition is that they are, you know, it's an example of rules that are meant to be broken. So it's, it's not a foolproof thing. It's not something that I'm saying every time you take a picture, you should have your subject off center in one of those corners. But I think that it can be a tool that helps your eye to naturally go to what it is that you want it to look at. So, so that's the rule of thirds. And then, like I mentioned, rules are meant to be broken. Now they're symmetry. <laughs> so it's just another way to guide your viewer's eyes and to create an eye-catching uh, photograph. So symmetry, of course, is exactly, most of us probably are familiar with the term, but 
it just basically means that if you were to fold your photograph in half, both sides would be approximately the same. So um, the, the woman at the bar studio on the left, if we were to fold it straight down the middle between her feet, it would be almost identical on either side. And then um, on the other, in the other photograph, we have the, the two sides of the grocery store aisle um, to create the symmetry for that image. So symmetry is a great way of guiding your viewer's eyes and creating something that's a little bit more eye-catching. Um, you know, we want to be able to create photographs that are going to slow our viewers scroll through Instagram, right? Like we want, we want them to slow down and look at our picture for just a second longer than they looked at all the other ones. So this is just another tool um, to do that. So Nikki, real quick, I'm, I'm looking on my phone because you told me to. Um, and when, so if I take a picture that's kind of like, like I take it broader than, than I would, than, than the actual photo I want, and I go into editing, that's where that grid is, and I can move the photo around? Is that kind of what you were thinking? Well, that's not what I was thinking. Okay. What I was thinking is that if you go into the settings, like the main settings on your phone, yeah. um, if you go down to where the camera is, at least that's where it is on mine. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty different, yeah. Okay. When I, when I go there, I have an option of turning on the grid. So I see the grid uh, as I'm taking my picture. Taking the picture. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's, um, you know, knowing where it is later is great too, but sometimes we don't give ourselves enough space when we take the initial shot to be able to crop down to create, you know, that rule of thirds. Wow. So having it on your camera when you take the shot is helpful. Love it. Thank you. Yep. And so balance and negative space, these kind of go hand in hand. And this again uh, goes back to that idea of the rule of thirds. So um, I think that the bottom left-hand corner, he's probably a little to the left of the actual third, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so basically it's just a, a way of giving your viewers eyes a rest. So um, it gives them, it helps to really um, uh, lead their eye to your subject matter and the rest of the photo sort of uh, becomes not irrelevant, but um, it just really highlights your subject. And the negative space doesn't need to be completely clear. I mean, obviously in both of these photographs, there are, you know, there's hills and trees and, and grass and that sort of thing. But, um, but that becomes so simplified compared to the subject that it just really helps to guide your viewer's eyes and create a little bit more of an eye-catching eye photo. So leading lines, these are fun to play with. These are um, literally what they are, the, what it says. They, they're lines that are in your natural environment that will lead your viewer's eyes to your subject. So um, on the left, we have the the lines from the guardrail that are le leading your eyes to the subject. And this is another example of, of balance and negative space. Um, and then in the other photograph, we have the lines from the, from the walkway leading straight to the little boy who's waiting to come see his dad. So, um, so leading lines are really fun to play with. And if you start noticing, if you start thinking about them, you'll see them everywhere. Um, <coughs> excuse me, they are um, in, everywhere. I mean, there, you know, if you look at the floor, the tile lines can lead your eyes to your viewer. Um, banisters, things like that, they, they are in all of our situations. So they're a fun thing to play with. And then depth is a great um, tool to use to really create a more interesting um, composition to your photograph. And what depth means is that you have something in the foreground of your image, in the midground of your image, and in the background of your image. So um, it takes a little bit, this is probably a little bit more of an advanced element of composition, I suppose, but, um, but when you start playing around with it, you'll see, you'll find yourself um, placing objects or, or jumping behind people so that you have blurry people in the foreground and then your, your subject is in the midground. Um, so it's just, it's just a way to add um, added interest and um, curiosity to your picture. And it kind of gives your viewer a little bit more to look at when they're looking at your photograph, so. And then framing is another fantastic way to draw your viewer's eye to your subject. And you can use frames that are in the physical environment of where you're shooting, doorways, windows, um, anything like that. Or you can also use people. I use people to frame other people all the time. So in this other example, um, the girl in the backseat, uh, 
she's headed to her Taekwondo uh, testing and is nervous, obviously, and scared. And so this is my daughter. And so I was sitting in the front seat and I turned around and I could see that she was perfectly framed by the two car seats in the middle of the car. Um, so it's just, it's another way to, to, to guide your viewer's eyes to what it is that you want them to see. So I love to play around with framing. If you look, uh, uh, similar to leading lines, frames are everywhere in your space. So just think about them um, creatively and just try to play around and see where you can find. So perspective and details are um, another favorite thing for me to capture and to play around with. So perspective, and when I use the term perspective, I mean, where is my body and where is my camera as the photographer? Am I, um, what I like to, to use in as example is that a lot of times when we, as adult sized humans, when we take a picture of a child, we stand upright and we hold our camera to where our face is and we point it at an angle and we take a picture of a child. And that's fine. Um, and I have thousands of those of my kids, but it's probably the most um, expected perspective that we would have of that situation. So if you vary your perspective, you can create so much more interest um, and you can communicate specific feelings or emotions about that photograph. So if I were to have a small child, I could stand directly over the top of them and take my picture and I could highlight their, their smallness or their vulnerability. But if I were to, um, let's say I was shooting um, a particularly strong woman at a gym or um, something like that, I might lay on the ground and take a picture of her while she's lifting weights or doing some beautiful yoga pose or something like that, which would um, highlight her strength and her um, carriage and her poise. So moving your body around your space is really important. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this next time when we talk about zooming with your phone camera. Um, uh, but don't do it <laughs> because it automatically degrades the, the quality of the image. So if you zoom, you're the, the, it's going to get blurry and grainy and it's not going to be the same quality photograph as if you use it, um, <clears throat> if you don't zoom. So I, as a photographer, I actually don't use zoom lenses. I use, I have a little collection of lenses that are called prime lenses, which means they um, are a certain focal length and they don't zoom. So I have to zoom with my feet. And so um, I think that naturally makes it a little easier to transition to a phone camera because I'm used to moving in really close if I want a closer up picture or moving my body far back if I really want to get that environmental um, far away shot. So changing your perspective, not only is it going to be able to communicate a more specific um, message in that particular picture, but it's also going to create variety in your social media feed. So if you have all the same, you know, chest or waist up photographs um, in your feed, it's just going to look a little bit monotonous. But if you switch things up and you get down on the floor, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have um, left a shoot with like my shirt and pants dirty because I've been laying in the floor in order, if, particularly like if there are children, or um, recently I shot at a gym and I wanted to capture the kettlebells on the ground. And so I lay on the ground and that's, I mean, just moving your body around like that really creates um, variety and interest and communicates much more specifically what your message is. So, and then capturing those details. Um, I love hands. I love hands that are doing things. Um, like both of these photographs, they're holding hands. Um, so I shoot tons of hands and whenever I shoot family, whenever I do family shots, but any kind of detail. So if you have um, people signing a form, of course you wouldn't want to make sure that you're far enough away that you're not reading the words, but um, things like that, or, you know, keys opening a door or um, uh, making food, you know, like the hands that are working to prepare the food are so important. And that is, I think this, photographs like of that kind of detail really create interest in your social media and marketing outreach. So, um, you know, like even the preparation of the food or a big giant container of tomatoes or, or things like that, like that kind of detail work really, um, as a person who views a lot of social media, 
I love seeing photographs like that. So, um, so vary your perspective and capture those details. Love that, Nikki. Hey, I'm just going to give you the, and um, we have got about 10 minutes left. And so okay. I want to make sure that um, everybody else knows that as well. So that um, if you've got some questions, and I know that Nikki, you're going to set us up with some homework too. So I want to make sure we have, <laughs> have time for those assignments. Everybody's in virtual school now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So scale is another fun thing to play with. Um, both of these photographs are of my children. Um, I try to vary the pictures that I'm including from client work and then also just my family work because I tend to have millions of those. But um, so scale, like I mentioned before, when using perspective, you can also highlight scale um, and it makes for a really impactful um, image. So, you know, you can show the, the smallness of, of a child or something that you're um, working with as in addition to the, you know, the grandiose sorts of um, images that you may uh, encounter in your in your work. So vary the scale and really try to highlight it by using things um, in the same image that really um, exaggerate it or make it obvious that the scale is either large or small. So, And then um, we talked a little bit about isolating your main subject. So what you want to do is you want your, your viewer to know immediately what your main subject is. And you can do that by um, using light. So like in the picture on the right hand side, she's standing with a mirror, I mean a mirror, a window, um, basically directly to the right of that image. And so the window light is coming in on her, but the rest of the kitchen is darkened. And so that light on her body helps to isolate her from the background and it creates less distraction. Whereas if I had turned on the kitchen light, um, you would see so much of the mess that is my kitchen <laughs> in the background. And um, it would just make, it would make the main subject less um, obvious um, and a lot more distracting in the background. And then you can use things like color. So if your background is kind of a neutral color, um, you can try to capture a subject that's in a, a bright color. Um, color can really help um, isolate your main subject from the background. And then using a blurred background also really helps in that um, a lot of the newer cameras, as well as some editing um, apps that we'll talk about next time can help you to create a blurred background um, so that it uh, isolates your subject away from it. And then leave space for movement. This is something that is a tiny pet peeve of mine. Um, when you have a moving subject, you want to give them space in the frame to move. So like these kids who are about to play with these cups, they're running it, racing across the gym um, at the same time that they're stacking these cups. And so I intentionally shot them on the right hand side of the image so that they visually for my viewer would have space to run. So I highly recommend doing this. Um, <clears throat> leave space for the action of your subjects. And then micro composition, we're not going to have time this time, but maybe next time if you come, there's this little tiny short video that I wanted to show you um, from a, one of my favorite photographers. His name is Sam Abel, and he is a National Geographic uh, Society photographer. And um, he talks about micro composition. And what, what that means that in the short version is that as the photographer, you park yourself somewhere where a background is pleasing to you. So you find yourself, um, you find a spot and you create a back or you um, intentionally put yourself in a position where the background is pleasing and then you wait for the action to happen. Um, as humans, we tend to do the same thing over. So if we, if kids do one thing, they're probably going to do it again. If um, in a yoga class, you can anticipate what's going to happen. As um, a food truck owner, you're going to anticipate that you're going to have a very similar scene for most of the lunch rush. You know, you're going to have people approaching your truck. Um, and the same thing like for the for the Airbnb situation, you're, you know, you know that every time a new client comes to the um, to the rental property, it's going to be a similar sort of um, uh, behavioral momentum. So you can count on that and you can plan to what you're gonna do next time. So next time during this yoga class, I'm going to, um, of course, I'm gonna ask my people that it's okay, if it's okay first, but then I'm going to park myself in this corner because I really love the view of the background of that side of the yoga studio, or because the light will be really pretty behind me shining on the yoga um, people who are doing yoga. Um, 
and then you wait. So then you wait for your subject to do something interesting and you shoot through the scene. So you put your phone on burst mode, which we'll talk about next time, and you shoot from the beginning all the way through because oftentimes the most interesting shot is the reaction after it's over. So that's what he talks about um, in this video that we might have time to watch next time. But um, so th that's the concept of micro composition. And it's, I use it all the time because like I said, as humans, we are repetitive creatures and we do the same thing over and over. And so as a photographer, you can take advantage of that and plan for your next shot. So um, we'll go through this real quick. So there's different types of shots. There's the wide angle that's gonna establish your setting. Um, there's the full shot, which where you'll see the subjects or your items entire body or form. Um, and then a partial shot and then the detail shot. So the point of including this is that I want you to try to vary the shots that you're taking because not only throughout your social media feed will it make it more interesting, but you'll be able to, even if you took the, the one situation, let's say like a yoga class or lunch rush at your, at, your, um, at your food truck, if you took 10 minutes and tried to get one of each types of those shots, then you're gonna have a really well-rounded story of what that lunch rush was. So you may step back and take a picture of the line. You may um, stand to the side and take a picture of somebody who's at the window ordering. You may shoot from the inside window out of the, you know, the top part of their body as they're paying or receiving their food. And then you may um, you know, take a picture over their shoulder with permission <laughs> of them like picking up their tacos or whatever. Um, so, that varying the shot types can really create interest in your story overall and then throughout your, your scrolling feed. So, and then storytelling and photography. So questions that you wanna ask yourself before you take your shot are what, first of all, you wanna brainstorm what your company's story is and what can the scene help communicate to that story? And then decide what is my main subject? Is my main subject the food or is my main subject the customer who's buying the food or is the person who's making the food? or what um and then what's the best type of shot to tell that story is it a detail shot of them enjoying their food is it the line to show how busy we are or um is it that moment at the end of the yoga class when everybody's um calm and and um i forgot the yoga word so i don't know it <laughs> relaxing at the end um and then where should i as the photographer be should i where should my, what should, what's the best kind of light for the situation? What's the best perspective? And where's the best background that's gonna be the least distracting? So um, it sounds like a lot. So my suggestion is always to practice. I mean, we have so much, my, we have so much um, opportunity to create photographs, to, to create um, a portfolio. So you can create a folder in your camera roll where you are proactively shooting so that you have a whole variety of shots to use whenever you need to post something new so that you're not frantically trying to, um, oh, I need a picture of this, but it's not happening, or there's no one here right now, or it's really, really cloudy and it's too dark, so I can't capture this lovely living room. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shoot proactively and I'm gonna create this portfolio of a variety of different types of shots so that I have them handy whenever I am planning my social media posts in the future. Um, it takes a lot of pressure off of you and it gives you an opportunity to really practice those different types of elements of composition. Um, so when you are, like I mentioned, that list was really long and there was tons of stuff there. But if you were to say to yourself, okay, today I wanna use framing to try to capture um, community. So think through what your brainstormed list is of what your, the culture of your organization is that you wanna to try to communicate and then choose one of those elements of composition to try to practice with it. I'm gonna use um, capturing details to try to communicate excellence or so on and so forth. So just pick one. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to do all of them at once. It would be impossible to use all of those different types of elements of communication in one photograph, obviously. So just pick one and pick one um, thought or mission or value that you're trying to communicate and um, just practice. You have to practice intentionally so that you can get comfortable, um, you know, using those different elements and just become a, a, a student of your space 
of the light that comes through your space throughout the day and throughout the year because it changes and then um, become a student of the of the resources that you have in your space as far as framing and um, leading lines and that sort of a thing to really know oh this this particular corner looks fantastic in the morning so I'm going to you know shoot um, something in that corner tomorrow that I, that's going to attempt to communicate this element of our company's mission so um, so yeah so that is what we have for today next time we're going to talk about more specifics about uh, smartphones so we're going to talk about settings and modes that will be helpful for you to be able to capture um, the shots that you want to capture and we'll talk about editing on your smartphone we'll talk about some um, recommendations that I have on that and then if you would like to which we highly encourage um, you can email me examples of some photographs that you've taken um, after today just based on some of the things that we've talked about and we can uh, talk about them as a, as a group next time. We can um, admire your photographs and, <laughs> and just give some feedback and that sort of a thing. And don't be scared, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's a great way to learn, I think, when we have, um, I've done the same thing. I've had portfolio reviews from photographers that I admire who look through my photographs and just give me um, feedback on them. And so I think it's helpful, helpful as we're moving forward and talking about some new information next time to be able to um, kind of review what we talked about today. So, so you can send those examples there, Nikki at NikkiToastPhotography.com. And awesome. yeah, well, and I will go ahead and interject here one, one, first of all, thank you. Wonderful so much to look forward to in number two you have me on the edge of my um my rolly seat here um, <laughs> september 30th is um is part two so um again if you uh follow us on instagram or um, facebook or linkedin we will be posting about that but probably the best way to um to keep in touch with us is to go to sbtdc at dot uark dot, dot edu sbtdc dot uark dot edu and um um, and sign up for um, notifications. You can also just go there and register for um, part two right now. So um, thank you again, Nikki, and thank you all for being here. Um, find a full listing of the workshops also at sbtdc.uark.edu. And um, we hope to see you again at the next workshop. So thank you again all. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, you can get in, in touch with Nikki and you can get in touch with us. So um, we will see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>